afternoon on queering citizenship across time, space, and literature. We have three speakers, very, very interesting uh, papers they're going to deliver. Uh, I will introduce them one by one, and I guess I'd ask you to save questions for the end. When they're done, we'll have a question session. Our first speaker is Evan Vipon from the University of Toronto in Canada, obviously. <laughs> I'm reading in front of me, I assume we all actually know Toronto's in Canada. <laughs> um, transformative narratives, transgender representation in television. So my title has been slightly changed just to be a little more specific since I'll be presenting on one character, uh, Transnormative Narrative, Straightening Degrassi's Adam Torres. <clears throat> when Adam Torres arrives at Degrassi at the start of grade 10, he seems to be like any other normal teenaged boy, white, heterosexual, middle upper class, and able-bodied. He does not disclose that he was assigned female at birth and raised as a girl. When Bianca, a classmate, discovers that Adam is a female-to-male transgender boy, she outs him to the rest of the class and, uh, in a transphobic tirade, calling him a freak and ripping open his shirt to expose his bound breasts. Suddenly, Adam does not align with the image of the normal teenage boy. He appears slantwise in relation to the norms of youthful masculinity that he at first appeared to exemplify. In appearing slantwise, Adam might reopen affective and relational virtualities of gender and sexuality. However, following Adam's formal coming out as transgender and subsequent navigation of the trials and tribulations of assuming a male identity, he is met with compassion and ultimately accepted by the majority of his classmates. By subscribing to the imperatives of what I refer to as transnormativity, Adam achieves social acceptance, but forecloses in the process on the subversion of gender and sexual norms and the pro proliferation of trans identities that he may have affected through a non-normative gender embodiment. To be normative is to subscribe to a set of institutionally and socially enforced standards, ideals that are unquestioned and presumed to be essential and unchangeable. We constitute ourselves in relation to assumptions about what normal boys and girls look and act like and how normal people behave, either reinforcing or resisting what it means to be normal. Normativity underwrites social hierarchies, distributing privilege to those who fall within the category of normal, and in turn, supporting the shaming and disadvantaging of those who fail to embody these ideals. To fit within the idolized norm, one must be white, heterosexual, middle class, Christian or secular, mentally and physically fit, cisgender and typically male. Anyone who deviates from this classification is in one way or another non-normative. Trans persons who are non-normative in one sense, that is by virtue of being cisgender, uh, by not being cisgender, excuse me, can be recuperated or folded into normative society by claiming the social capital associated with whiteness, middle class status, mental and physical fitness, heterosexuality, and adherence to gender norms. Gender normativity, specifically, is enforced through the naturalization of the bi-gender system, which Emma Gilbert explains, maintains that there are only two genders which correspond with the two sexes, male and female, which in turn excludes trans bodies and identities. Unsurprisingly then, many trans people aspire to be read as normal, adhering to gender norms and heteronormative practices in order to convince cisgender people that they are just like them. Trans characters and narratives continue to gain visibility in mainstream media. These representations usually feature medical narratives that legitimize transition by framing characters as suffering from a psychological disorder known as gender dysphoria, which can be cured through treatment. The representation of trans persons in the media is dichotomous, depicting either the sympathetic transsexual who is medically transitioned or is undergoing treatment, such as Adam, or the unsympathetic gender nonconforming deviant who fails to assimilate. By largely restricting visibility to supposedly successful or normative trans persons, and in those few instances that feature gender nonconforming characters, casting them as deviant and punishable, Media representations gloss over the struggles faced by, for example, low-income trans persons and trans persons of color. 
In Degrassi, the focus of my analysis here, Adam is normalized as the right kind of trans person through medical discourses of transsexuality and transition, as well as through his adherence to social norms of masculinity, heterosexuality, Christianity, class, whiteness, and ability. While this affords Adam certain privileges and a sense of belonging within the plot of Degrassi, as a representation, it contributes to the further disenfranchisement of trans persons of color, working class trans persons, trans persons with disabilities, and trans persons who are gender non-conforming or non-normative. In mainstream media, trans persons are depicted as moving wholly from one side of the gender binary to the other to fit within the sex equals gender system. By restricting visibility to those who have or wish to medically transition, transnormative narratives affirm sex and gender as inherent in the body and genitals. Paradoxically, then, to be recognized as a trans person, one must conform to the modes of transnormalization that reinforce the bi-gender system and render one invisible. Adam exemplifies this paradox, illuminating how normativity works to straighten the transsexual through a medical narrative of transition that consequently renders other trans persons invisible. This, in turn, makes trans pers uh, the other trans persons who deviate from social norms hyper-visible and susceptible to punishment. Degrassi is a Canadian teen television drama that follows the lives of students of Degrassi, a community high school in Toronto, Ontario. Adam Torres, who is portrayed by actress Jordan Todesey, transfers to Degrassi with his older stepbrother, Drew. Initially, Adam is stealth and his classmates read him as cisgender. The show explores his gender identity and transition over three seasons until the character's sudden death due to a texting while driving accident in season 13. The characterization of Adam as a transgender teenager not only allows for an exploration of transitioning during puberty, but also reveals how growing up is an effect of what Sarah Amon refers to as straightening devices. Queer theorist Lee Edelman argues that the child has become a symbol for reproductive futurism and the heteronormative nuclear family, a promise for a normative heterosexual future that could not exist otherwise. However, Stephen Brum and Natasha Hurley argue that the child is already a queer figure, one that is normalized and straightened through the promise and expectation of heterosexual adulthood. Catherine von Stockton explains that rather than growing up, the queer child grows sideways by failing to proper, properly orient her or himself toward the heterosexual adult that she or he is expected to become. The insights of these queer theorists highlight that Adam, as a trans and therefore queer adolescent, threatens to grow sideways, but by adhering to the imperatives of transnormativity, straightens or realigns himself by growing up along the vertical axis of heteronormativity. This straightening renders Adam invisible as a trans person and forecloses on the possibilities of non-normative trans embodiment. My master's research paper is divided into three sections, each focusing on different narratives that seek to normalize and straighten Adam. The first section provides an overview of the history of trans medicalization and pathologization, along with the born in the wrong body narrative. Drawing on Foucault's discussion of confessional science, I problematize the way in which Adam must continually confess his true gender identity to receive a diagnosis and treatment, which prompts him to rely on medical discourses to legitimize his desire to transition. The second section focuses on discourses of heteronormative masculinity and the deployment of Ahmed's straightening devices. Adam's ultimate goal is to pass as a heterosexual cisgender young man, which leads him both to distance himself from lesbians and gay men, and through his relationship with devout Christian Becky Baker, to align himself with heteronormative white middle-class family values. The third section broadens my analysis of Adam to take into account his construction through neoliberal discourses of class, race, and individual rights. As a white, upper-middle-class, able-bodied person, Adam is afforded the privileges of economic access and social inclusion. Ultimately, Adam is folded into white, middle-class heteronormativity, a social realm from which trans persons from low-income families, trans persons of color, and trans persons with physical disabilities are excluded. The conclusion offers a critical analysis of Adam's death, examining the ways he continues to be normalized and straightened even in his absence. The following scene analyses are excerpts from the second section entitled Heterosexuality, Masculinity, and Straightening Devices. 
Degrassi juxtaposes Adam's trans identity with the eventual lesbianism of his first girlfriend, Fiona, exemplifying how pop cultural texts frequently deploy lesbian characters <coughs> to distinguish transsexuality and gender identity from homosexuality and sexual orientation, and in the process, save trans men from deviance. As Halberstam observes, distinctions between butch lesbians and FTMs like Adam contribute to heteronormativity but by consigning heterosexuality to pathology and by linking transsexuality to a new form of heterosexuality. The lesbian does not follow the straight path and appears more slanted than the straight transsexual, thus redeeming trans persons through heterosexuality. Fiona, who initially dates heterosexual cisgender boys, distinguishes Adam, and by extension trans men, from lesbianism through her sexual desires. Adam's relationship with Fiona, who comes out as a lesbian shortly after dating him, establishes Adam as a straight man who is not interested in dating a queer woman. Much to Adam's chagrin, Fiona desires him for being the best of both worlds, which alludes to an alternative path that destabilizes the gender binary and exceeds normative sexuality. Adam immediately forecloses on this alternative, exclaiming, no, I'm not Fiona, I'm a guy thus reorienting Fiona in the process of reorienting himself. This illuminates the ways in which straightening devices work in tandem. Straightening one line may mean reorienting another. Adam exclaims on his way out the door, you don't want me, face it Fiona, you want a girl. By telling Fiona that she wants a girl and therefore cannot want him, Adam reinforces his straightness and masculinity by distancing himself from androgyny and, at the same time, reorients Fiona towards queer femininity. Fiona cannot desire androgyny because that would imply she desires Adam as a trans man, situating him as an object of homosexual desire. Adam reorients Fiona's desire for androgyny towards women, distancing himself from female masculinity and realigning himself with normal, that is, unmarked, masculinity. Adam's juxtaposition with male homosexuality, too, reinforces that transsexuality and homosexuality are mutually exclusive. Adam's, non, Adam's normative embodiment of masculinity is naturalized and unmarked next to Tristan, a young, effeminate gay boy from Degrassi, whose alternative masculinity or effeminacy becomes visible through his non-compliance with hegemonic masculine norms. Tristan's gay boyness effectively straightens Adam's trans boyness and realigns Adam with heterosexual masculinity. Tori, Tristan's friend, sets Adam up on a blind date with Tristan, reading Adam as a gay boy. When Tristan arrives for the date, Adam is shocked that he was misread as gay rather than trans. Adam explains, I'm not gay, I like girls. Tori asks bewilderingly, but what about the rainbow pin on your bag? To which Adam responds, LGBT, I'm the T part. Tori assumes that the rainbow is a symbol of queer sexuality. When Adam explains that he is the T part, it is clear that Tori assumed Adam is gay and therefore cisgender. Occupying multiple identities, such as trans and homosexual, or occupying a space between identities, renders one unintelligibly queer within what Butler formulates as the heterosexual matrix, or the grid of cultural intelligibility through which bodies, genders, and desires are naturalized. Adam forecloses the possibility of occupying a queer space, which would render him unintelligible by delineating specific categories of identification, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Adam separates the T from the rest of the acronym, suggesting that because he is T, he is not L, G, or B. Adam refers to the blind date debacle as an instance of broken LGBT telephone, in which one must choose either a sexual identity, L, G, or B, or a gender identity, the T. Adam rejects a queer gender or sexual identity, allowing him to reorient himself as a culturally intelligible straight boy. Adam's legibility as a heterosexual boy aligns with what Ahmed refers to as happiness scripts, which promise rewards or happy futures in exchange for adherence to the norms that facilitate social reproduction. Ahmed argues that happiness scripts could be thought of as straightening devices, ways of aligning bodies with what is already lined up. This alignment with what is already lined up, that is, the values and norms of heteronormative society, is what renders one culturally intelligible. According to Butler, 
Persons only become intelligible through becoming gendered in conformity with recognizable standards of gender intelligibility. When read together, these theorizations are particularly useful in understanding the ways that trans persons can be straightened by aligning themselves with gendered scripts of happiness. Ahmed explains that gendered scripts provide a set of instructions for what women and men must do in order to be happy, whereby happiness is what follows being natural or good. Natural and good are often associated with morality, in which certain kinds of happiness are more valued. In this way, morality too becomes a straightening device. On Degrassi, Adam is aligned with Christian morality through his relationship with Becky Baker, a conservative Baptist from Florida whose, path, whose father is a pastor. Uh, straightness, Ahmed explains, gets attached to other values, including decent, conventional, direct, and honest, which extends Becky's morality to Adam through her heterosexual attraction. Becky's religious views provide her with a strong moral compass that acts as a straightening device for Adam. If she can look past his biological sex and view him as a heterosexual boy, then it must be morally apprehensible to do so. Becky's feelings for Adam as a heterosexual trans boy straighten her within liberal Christian discourses of tolerance and acceptance. Even though Becky does not accept heterosexuality, which she views as a choice and thus immoral, she's able to accept Adam, who she views as a heterosexual boy with a correctable medical condition. Transnormative individuals like Adam, who fulfill the requirements of the normative transsexual subject, are rewarded through assimilation, allowing normative trans persons access to hetero and cisnormative institutions, while non-normative trans persons are rejected as sick and deviant, thus creating a hierarchy of good and bad trans subjects. Ultimately, transnormativity reinforces a singular definition of what it means to be trans and restricts access to those who, like Adam, can be folded into hegemonic discourses of white heterosexual middle-class society rendering non-normative trans persons invisible. While this allows for a cleaner or simpler storyline of transition, trans narratives must not be overly simplified or straightened, but embrace the complexity and slippages and contradictions of transitioning and living as trans within a sexist and heteronormative society. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful paper. The next speaker is Addie Schrodes. Schrodes. Schrodes, sorry. No worries. Transnationalizing Queer of Color Los Angeles, Modern and Postmodern Urban Experiences in John Vetchie's City of Night and Russell Leong's Phoenix Eyes. Thank you. Hi, my name's Addie. Um, I, well, thank you first for listening. I also wanted to note that I've changed the title since <laughs> submitting it. Um, so the new title is The Agency of Alterity and Queer of Color Los Angeles Literature from National Networks to Intimately Global. And I do appreciate your feedback. Global cities have rapidly transformed in the past 50 years, and Los Angeles emerges as the epitome of this change in the United States. LA has seen a simultaneous rise in localized communities and an extension of its socioeconomic boundaries. Scholars of urban planning and geography look at Los Angeles' demographic and built changes and begin to ask how the way people imagine and live in this city has also shifted. Queer geography locates this inquiry in LGBTQ communities and often examines the long relationship between queerness and the city. While these fields primarily employ social science research, I move to examine urban change through an interdisciplinary lens, focusing on the narrative works of John Ritchie and Russell Leong texts that reflect and irradiate the historical changes and lived experience in Los Angeles. Ritchie's novel City of Night depicts queer communities on the streets of American cities, including LA, in the early 1960s. Importantly, these communities reflect a queerness alternative to what is typically represented in urban scholarship. Here, homelessness and hustling are central to the life of the urban LGBTQ community. While Ritchie reflects the agency of alterity as it engenders a national network in cities, the queerness and communities he depicts have strict and interconnected boundaries that begin and end with the nation. By contrast, queerness in the urban landscape are unbounded at the turn of the millennium in Russell Leong's collection of short stories, Phoenix Eyes. Leong's LA is both locally differentiated and globally dispersed as he points outward toward, toward, toward transnational urban queer connectivity. In this way, he maintains Richie's interest in queer agency to form urban networks 
but far from being bound by his na national borders, his LA is intimately global. My goal is to take seriously these writers' emphasis on the agency of alterity by making queer narratives central to an urban inquiry. The questions I address in this paper are then twofold. What can queer texts tell us about the experience and process of urban globalization? And what agency does queerness have in influencing these experiences and processes? In this paper, I argue Richie and Leon's texts illustrate the entwined relationship of queerness in the city, pointing to the agency of alterity to shape urban space and create urban connections. I want to suggest also that this agency grows with globalization, as the applied field and possibilities of queerness expand with the city. Richie's novel traces mid-century queer communities in US cities, and he structurally emphasizes that to speak of the queer experience is to speak of the urban experience. Published in 1963, City of Night depicts cities and their queer scenes as uneasy places of social unrest linked in a web of American metropolises. Rich's first sentence ominously frames the novel as exposing this paradox paradoxical experience of national connection and personal isolation. Quote, later I would think of America as one vast city at night, stretching gaudily from Times Square to Hollywood Boulevard, jukebox winking, rock and roll moaning, America at night, fusing its dark cities into the unmistakable shape of loneliness, unquote. While Rich's book engages with America's urban queer subculture, the narrator pointedly speaks on the level of mainstream culture. America and American culture in this sense are its cities and urban culture, and the narrator maps the metaphorical expanse of urbanity in the capitalized city of night. The stellate impressiveness of these cities is also what causes individuals alienation, since the narrator rewrites city of night as a claustrophobic lowercase compound dark cities. America as city of night com commands the verbs and the agency in this paragraph. It stretches gaudily, fusing its dark cities. Ritchie's narrator insists upon the representationality of the queer urban experience he describes, as his opening passage interpolates readers to recall a shared memory. He addresses readers conversationally, foregrounding collective remembrance. Quote, remember Pershing Square and the apathetic palm trees, Central Park and the frantic shadows, movie theaters and the angry morning hours, and wounded Chicago streets. Not only are these calls to remembrance descriptions of architecture and planning that any urban reader could summon, the images also become metaphors for a shared urban experience, one of apathy, fear, anger, and wounding. The narrator repeats the call to remember once more. Quote, remember rock and roll sex music blasting from jukeboxes, leering obscenely, blinking many colored along the streets of America, strung like a cheap necklace from 42nd Street to Market Street, San Francisco, unquote. The narrator further emphasizes the interchangeability and networked nature of American cities, as American streets, along with urban culture, stretch from coast to coast. Crucially, the narrator closes the novel's opening passage with an appeal to the, quote, lives lived out darkly in that vast city of night, a phrase that underlines the importance of the lived experience within urban space. The book itself is as interested in depicting urban life as, in, as it is in depicting queer life, and we will see that the two are intricately related. The novel develops the queer subcultural world of American cities and emphasizes that this subculture is inextricable from cities themselves. Originally from the windy desert outskirts of El Paso, a small city of around 130,000 people in the 1950s, the narrator discovers this subcultural, quote, world, unquote, in Dallas, quote, with the excitement of someone exploring a new country, unquote. Drawn to the seething world of hustling, he feels compelled to go to New York, and the narrator observes, Quote, when I reached New York, that world was waiting for me. The world exists in each metropolis, and the narrator describes that cities not only resemble one another, but are also constitutively linked by culture and membership. And the, narr the narrator travels soon to Los Angeles, emphasizing its inclusion in this urban network. Quote, I know that moments from arriving here, I have found an extension in the warm, if smoggy sun of the world I just left, unquote. Cities are places united in their sexual alterity. In a flip from the opening passage in which America and its continuous cities of night held agency, here the queer subculture holds the agency to connect cities in a network of exchange. However, the narrator is careful to distinguish between the agency of alterity in the seething world and the recurrent lack of agency of the people within it. Trans women and masculine hustlers in the novel regularly fear apprehension by the police and are sometimes homeless and drifting non volitionally. The narrator recounts, quote, life is lived on the brink of panic on the streets, and he describes a police car as a, quote, slowly moving hearse. Queer people in the novel often come to the city for community and sexual and gender expression, but they also experience loneliness, exclusion, and discrimination. 
In the case of LA, queer people frequently leave the city, sometimes to return, but often to disappear into urban anonymity. The narrator says of the trans woman who framed his experience of LA once she disappeared, quote, I imagine Miss Destiny sitting lonesomely in somewhere, big city, America, carefully applying her makeup. Indeed, queer people and culture themselves often disappear into interchangeable built markers, such as the streets, the movie theaters, Main Street, and the parks. In this sense, the experience of anonymity and its resultant loneliness arises in the monolithic built spaces of American cities. The limited agency of alterity in City of Night perhaps also arises in the boundaries of queerness at the time of writing. The term queer within the novel is an exclusively derogatory term, and it is used to police the boundaries of acceptable sexual alterity. The novel's internally accepted queer community consists of, quote, queens and male hustlers, exemplified by, quote, Chuck the masculine cowboy and Miss Destiny the femme queen. The narrator explains, quote, the queens being technically men, but no one thinks of them that way, always she, their husbands being the ma masculine vagrants. He is not himself considered queer. He remains in the vocabulary of that word, world, trade. Femme queens and trade thus operate with a semblance of heteronormativity that I argue makes the two internally acceptable. Characters in the novel frequently drive femininity and men and gay sex out of trade. At times, the narrator expresses his comfort with these rules, and he does not always adhere to them. He also shows empathy for the people the world he inhabits would otherwise classify as queers. On Laguna Beach, he describes, quote, homosexuals ritualistically, protectively assembled in one close area, like flotsam on the beach, as if symbolically defying the world that shut them out, a world with so little compassion, unquote. Richie capitalizes protectively to emphasize the real dangers and discrimination they face, highlighting the limitation of queer urban experience. The narrator's appeal to compassion arguably imagines a world that could be different. Russell Leong's year 2000 collection of short stories, Phoenix Eyes, reveals a queer urbanity unbound, an agency thus expands with the city. Like Richie's novel, Leong's collection often represents arguably alternative homosexuality seen in hustling and trade. But Leong's LA and its queerness have globalized, at once expansive in definition and transnational in possibility. Each of Leong's short stories feature unique protagonist, and camouflage is particularly useful to observe the revisional agency of queerness. The story follows Bernard Tan, a Filipino-American artist and volunteer at a downtown Asian AIDS clinic, as he starts dancing at, quote, Club Camouflage, a gay male dance show. The story is open and explicit about gender, sex, and sexuality, which works to illustrate the difference from the LA world of Richie's novel. Gone is cowboy Chuck and the hypermasculine, traditionally American objects of attraction. Here, gender and sexuality are both, are both more fluid and more global. As a dancer, Bernard we wears a white G-string and a hip-length red kimono-style jacket, and used the Japanese name Sukhoi to complicate transnationality with a nod to exotification. Even so, he dances to music from his country of birth, Bambi Palaka's Head Full of Love. In Camouflage, the borders of queer culture have extended indefinitely, which follows Edward Soja's work on the, quote, globally restructured metropolitan region. And yet, the global this global expanse brings with it a reemergence of local specificity, a point that also accords with Soja's research. He observes that the, quote, emergency of the emergence of transnational globality as seen in has seen also an attendant rise in the power of the local, both to accommodate and to resist the forces of globalization. Illustrating this shift, Leong does not observe the interchangeable cities and anonymous places that Ritchie does. For him, the global creates the agency of the local. The collection's eponymous story, Phoenix Eyes, stages Los Angeles's emergence in a global network and illustrates queer agency in developing these links on the economic, cultural, and humanistic levels. The story begins and ends with Terence, the protagonist, and a, and a Buddhist temple in downtown Los Angeles, a formal bookend that emphasizes LA's link to Asia, a point to which I will return. The story's middle serves as an analepsis or flashback to Terence's journey working on an international queer call line centered in Asia as he pursues his career as a theater designer. He first travels to Asia in 1972, the same year the US, quote, broke 20 years of Cold War policy toward China for the opportunities in theater design and for an airline steward based in Taipei. When the relationship ends, Terence discovers a queer urban network stretching across Asia in the form of the Hong Kong Xian, the international call line. Though Terence works in, a, in the sex trade of, quote, high-priced young men and women who made themselves available in Taipei, Hong Kong, Manila, Bangkok, and foregrounds the client's agency in objectifying the escorts, he also emphasizes the escort's agency of social grace in influencing their clients and determining their trajectory. 
He uses his, quote, English and art background to advance with his mostly male and mostly Western clients, not only getting the funds he needs for design work, but also shaping their perspective on trans-Asian subjectivity. While his work in design begins to thrive along his sex work, he also exercises the agency to cultivate a relationship with fellow escort P, as they often set up work in the same city as far as, quote, London, Canada, or New York, so they could rendezvous later and compare notes. The connection between P becomes a companionship that informs his visit to the Buddhist temple in LA, where he settled down after achieving success in design for a global market. If Phoenix Eyes implicates LA in a global network of cities and highlights the agency of alterity in establishing this network, Camouflage reveals what a global city looks like from the queer eye, for whom the city is intimately global. Protagonist and narrator Bernard grew up in Manila and cultivates relationships with the Philippines, which in turn influence LA. He speaks Tagalog with his father, who lives in Canada, and he tells readers, quote, most of the night I'd been up listening to my Tiano Tablos disc, which a friend brought from Manila when he came through LA. These cultural contexts reflect the experience of migration and the continuing connectedness of LA to other places in the Pacific Rim. Bernard looks at the glowing Hollywood Hills at six in the morning and thinks of Manila, quote, sometimes I miss the humidity and the red and silver jeepneys at 6 a.m. The juxtaposition of sensory effects in the soft glow of the Hollywood Hills and the brightness of the Manila jeepneys gives way to a physical comparison of built environments. The, quote, iron window bars on his house in Manila, through which, quote, no one could break in, but I couldn't break out either, parallel the later image of club camouflage with its painted, quote, rope nets and black metal bars over the ceiling. LA becomes intimately global, familiar in its link to other transnational places rich with history, meaning, and memory. Transnational experiences shape the built city, so much so that LA is no longer interchangeable with other American cities, as it is in Reche. Its places are no longer anonymous. The local specificity of LA in Leon's short stories arises then in its globality and the resultant intersections of experience that become part of the urban grid. The global indeed inflects the local to shape its appearance and experience. Crewness I have explored in this paper is a central facet of identity that reveals and molds the transnational city, just as queerness indispensably shapes the nation and city of night. Indeed, Liang's global queerness emphasizes the myriad regional origins and practices of queer cultures as they interact with and instantiate the global city of LA. I argue that, queer, that urban space with queerness becomes multiply more particular as it becomes more global. The LA Buddhist temple that frames the story in a phoenix eyes exemplifies the globality of the local, emphasizing also how we must take queerness into account to assess the lived experience of urban space. Formerly, the temple becomes a site of transnational memory, as the places connected to LA on socioeconomic and humanistic levels inflect the temple with meaning. It is also a site of queer memory inseparable from the transnational, as it is the place the narrator and P went whenever he visited LA. The story reveals that P, who had settled in San Francisco, recently died of AIDS, and the relationship prompts Terence to return to the temple to listen to the five Buddhist precepts as monks take their vows. The cultural specificity of Terence and P's queer practice then shape the meaning and use of urban space. The story ends on a passage that emphasizes the generative power of queer relationships to alter space. Quote, I could sense his presence nearby. He was not the one whom my eyes had sought and loved or the one who had already lived and died. He was another, the one still waiting to be born. The narrator here gestures to the toward the futurity of queerness as it creates connections across continents and shapes the urban space of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our final paper will be presented by Will Clark, and it is called, at least it was called a while ago, I don't think it's changing. <laughs> Uh, their Own Times, Henry James, The Bostonians, Temporality, and the Postbellum Origins of Queer Citizenship. It seems sort of fitting that we're moving back in time um, <laughs> over the course of these three papers. Mine is definitely the earliest. And for those of you who are not um, centered around the United States, and then we got the perspective from Canada, this is a very US-centric project, so forgive it for that. Um, so here we go. Since the landmark cases, United States versus Windsor and Hollingsworth versus Perry in 2013, the legal landscape for gay subjects in the United States has substantively changed. In the years since these cases, the rapid fall of marriage bans in federal courts across the country have solidified marriage as the vector by which to negotiate LGBT social inclusion. 
with none less than Eric Holder, the U.S. Attorney General, declaring same-sex marriage the civil rights issue of our day, public officials increasingly imply that LGBT rights are at the cusp of resolution. Tellingly, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy elevates gay marriage to the forefront of the nation's civil rights evolution. As he writes in his majority opinion in the Windsor case, the legalization of same-sex marriage in many states represents, quote, our evolving understanding of the meaning of equality, end quote. Moreover, Kennedy observes that the changes to the law were prepared by, and I quote again, those who sought a voice in shaping the destiny in their own times, end quote. A nod to the capacity of communities to reshape the world in which they live. Joining Holder with a language of destiny and evolving rights, Kennedy signifies that the time to recognize the sexual citizenship of lesbian and gay couples has unequivocally arrived. Public discourse seems to agree that this albeit limited vision of gay rights is on the verge of legal resolution. Despite these advances, many in the gay community have questioned the way that the rich history of LGBTQ activism has given way to more staid political projects, which forsake historic discourses of gay difference for more anodyne positions of gay inclusion. Even these questions are not in themselves new. In his 1999 essay, Normal and Normaler, Michael Warner concludes that advocacy for same-sex marriage constitutes an assimilationist project rather than an advocacy for democratic change. He warns that, and I quote, pursuing marriage means abandoning the historic principles of the queer movement as antiquated, and he says, liberationism. Warner continues, to take a view on same-sex marriage pro or con is implicitly to imagine movement towards some future, wither America, wither faggotry. Here too, it is difficult to assume that the trend is one of progress, or rather, what seems to be the prevailing, or what seems to be prevailing are regressive narratives of progress, end quote. For Warner, marriage is not the teleological end of the post stonewall movement, but rather an abdication of that movement's ethos. Subsequently, his question is not about which political project queers might invest in, but the relation between queerness and the rhetoric of progress. In this sense, Warner asks what temporal rubric belies the rights sought by the LGBT community. The, the selection of marriage as a vector for securing LGBT rights appears to widen the gulf between public politics and queer scholarship, which worries about the disappearance of the tradition's culture and identifying practices that form queer history. But it's precisely because of the rhetoric of progress, which separates the skeptical praxis of queer theory from dominant political discussion of gay rights, that I believe queer scholarship has more to say than ever. A brief survey of titles from 2004 to 2010 illuminates a trend in which scholars have traced queer temporality in order to resist progressive narratives of state inclusion. Jose Munoz's Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer futurity, Jezebir Puar's Terrorist Assemblages, Homo Nationalism in Queer Times, Elizabeth Freeman's Time Binds, Queer Temporalities, Queer Histories, all foreground time as a way of renewing queer scholarship. Because queer theory now examines temporality, the temporality of queer subjects, it provides an essential rubric by which to challenge the assumed progress that buttresses LGBT politics today. A theory unifying what temporality or temporal qualities in the past, present, and future are identifiably queer seems elusive, however. Lee Edelman's 2004 No Future and Jose uh, Munoz's Cruising Utopia present an interesting contrast. In No Future, Edelman claims that one aspect of queer identity that is unique is the explicit rejection of the futurity attached to the heterosexual family, um, which is a nice little <laughs> uh, connection back to your paper. Writing that, and I quote, the queer in the order of the social is called forth to figure, the negativity opposed to every form of social viability. Edelman claims that social negativity represented by queers is in fact a site of empowerment. To Edelman, and I quote again, queerness undoes identities. Uh, end quote. By virtue of opposing the forms the state chooses to invest with subjected in citizenship. The queer subject thereby rejects social recognition by dismissing the citizen subject's requisite investment in the politics of futurity. Contradicting Edelman's rejection of futurity, Jose Munoz considers futurity a special realm of investment for queers, writing that queerness is not here yet and is an ideality such that we are not yet queer. Munoz concludes that a unique hallmark of queerness is that it is, oh, sorry, it is not simply a being, but a doing for or towards the future. 
Munoz suggests that queerness points towards a socially equitable world for which queers can and should agitate. Though Munoz and Edelman's theories diverge, I wish to focus on a commonality. Both negotiate how queerness works outside of civic membership by establishing differential temporal, temporal orientations for non-recognized subjects. Together they reveal a theme of recent queer scholarship, the temporality and contestations over the rights of civic inclusion are necessarily yoked. But where does that leave our analysis of LGBT rights if current academic inquiry seems ever separate from our current politics? Recent court decisions may help to illuminate a pathway for the role of marriage in establishing queer modes of disaffiliation. As Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals indicates in his dismantling of gay marriage bans in Wisconsin and Indiana, literature itself provides an essential mode for challenging tradition that can be used to inform proceedings in the court. Posner turns especially to what he calls famous literary stories that pillory so-called good traditions and thus form a pretext for imagining social arrangements outside of received social structures. As such, Posner suggests that literature uniquely conceives of so social constructions whose reality may be decades distant, if not more. I wish to expand from Posner's relationship between literature and the law to examine how literature shapes discourses of the rights of minority citizens. Henry James's 1885 novel, The Bostonians, particularly challenges this relation between the future of national membership and heteronormative sexual relations. In the Bostonians, queer subjects actively resist heteronormative futurity. James, in this sense, describes minority rights as a problem of temporality. And it is in this way of making queerness oppose progressive time that we can relate late 19th century sexuality to progressive discourse of rights negotiations today. For those of you not familiar with James's novel, I will situate it briefly. Set in the mid-1870s, around the closure of federal reconstruction following the Civil War, the Bostonians traces the intersecting lives of Olive Chancellor, famously shy feminist and advocate for women's suffrage, Verena Tarrant, who acts as Olive's public foil, and Basil Ransom, an unreconstructed southerner and advocate for the restriction of women to the private sphere. These three characters mark a love triangle, with both Olive and Basil seeking the affections of Verena, whose fate is either the public voice of feminism or as the private, secluded wife of Basil, compose the divergent political pathways that the novel will entertain. Contextually, the Bostonians is deeply tied to postbellum American politics. After the Civil War, the coalition of abolitionists, women's suffragists, and northern business interests that had been critical to the passage of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause collapsed. Ultimately, when Congress refused to expand the right to vote to women, the suffrage movement in the 1870s broke with the, with the Republican Party that was instrumental in expanding civil rights. Against this historical backdrop, James's The Bostonians reflects on the promises and failures of Reconstruction era's constitutional protections for underserved groups. James makes the connection between his novel and the changing social and political sphere of post-Reconstruction America explicit in, a, explicit in a letter to his publisher. Summarizing his intentions for the novel, James writes, and I quote, I wish to write a very American tale, a tale very characteristic of our social conditions, and I ask myself, what was the most salient and peculiar point in our social life? The answer was the situation of women, the decline of the sentiment of sex, the agitation on their behalf, end quote. In this brief note, James indicates that sentiment and political conflict via women's agitation for the right to vote are deeply interwoven. A conversation between Verena Tarrant and Basil Ransom midway through the Bostonians draws the political conflict in the novel even more starkly. Complaining to Ransom that, and I quote, the social system has no place for us and that society cannot leave us alone and must put us somewhere, Verena makes a case for the recognition of women in the public sphere on their own terms. Ransom responds by rejecting he, what he calls their fatuous agitation and by claiming that there is no, no place in public for women at all. He worries that women are being, and I quote again, less and less sought in marriage because of the pernicious effects of their public agitation. In sum, Ransom declares that activism has perverted his word, Verena, especially through, their intimate, or through her intimate relationship with Olive Chancellor. Ransom's implica implication is clear. Women must be sequestered from the rights that, involve, uh, that involvement in the public sphere might allow. The battle between Olive, Verena, and Ransom then 
is over more than affections, it is over the distribution and rights of rights and the future shape of the civic body. In Ransom's eyes, marriage acts as a kind of indexical marker, and his insistence on traditional marriage and his fear of Verena's perversion through her contact with Olive, he offers marriage as a last protection against Olive's queerness. From Ransom's perspective, Olive is a token signifier of the suffrage movement's disruptive danger. But this sense of Olive's oddity extends beyond Ransom. For the novel, Olive's identity as a political advocate is deeply implicated with her sexual characteristics. She is described as a spinster or a celibate, and most damningly, is unmarried by every implication of her being. Her sexual alterity emerges most visibly when Ransom suggests that all of sexual affinities mark her as somehow neither man nor woman. He asks what he calls the profane question. What sex was it, great heaven, that Olive was advocating for? In naming Olive as an other, and in questioning her sexual affiliations, the novel attaches the political future not only to the expansion of suffrage, but also the recognition of alternate sexualities. All of it seems is most dangerous because she represents a public sexuality that is decidedly queer. On the surface, the novel opposes Ransom's advocacy for so-called traditional marriage with Olive's categorical rejection of marriage. The novel encourages these polar opposites. Olive views matrimony as, and I quote, wanting in brightness, consisting of a tired woman holding a baby over a furnace register that emits lukewarm air, end quote. This specter of maternity, child rearing, and domesticity represents the retrograde history that Olive wishes to transcend. Conversely, Olive and Verena sequester themselves from public view to study what they call the past history, the present conditions, and the future prospects of their sex. In their seclusion, they seek what they call great geniuses of great characters who themselves change the course of history. Such figures in Olive's view, and I quote, take their own times and places for coming into the world and leave the gaping spectators to make them fit in. In effect, Olive and Verena claim a way of reading history that invites new orientations for women that seek individuals, individuals who claim their own times and places. It is the duty then of the non-normative figures, such as Olive and Verena, to make sense of these identities that previously had no name. Olive and Verena, secluded from the institutions of men, Reach back, reach back into historic archives in order to rewrite a public history through which they can advocate for a future expansion of women's rights. In this way, they agree with Munoz that their future is not yet queer. The novel is not quite this schematic in its attitudes to queer opposition to heteronormativity, however. One of the major problems in dismissing Ransom's vision of marriage and female privacy is the privacy that Olive and Verena entertain for themselves. Despite Olive's rejection of heterosexual marriage, her relationship with Verena is strangely marriage-like. It, it is described as a union of souls, as a close union, and as a partnership. In each instance, making their, their queer relationship legible through a normative institutional discourse. Despite Olive's reference to institutional forms of union and her marriage-like intimacy with Verena, James nonetheless dismisses marriage as a vehicle for the recognition of rights. The novel is careful to point out that Olive views her relationship with Verena as ephemeral. Though Olive is horrified at the, by the idea of Verena marrying, she nonetheless says that she would, quote, stay with her friend for as long as her friend might require it, and that Verena should, for the time, regard Olive's home as her own. By acknowledging that Verena may have a future outside of her relationship with Olive, the novel suggests that Olive's agitation for women's rights and non-normative sexuality is not tied to the monogamous bounds of marriage, nor is it schematically opposed. What I wish to suggest finally is that Olive, who the novel continually marks as a sexual other, is very careful to use social institutions to advance her own view of rights. She aims to transcend normative history and to change the public position and access to power that women have. Olive's goal is not to secure the rights to such unions as she and Verena share, but to broad public recognition of a woman's right to a social life outside of heterosexual norms. Olive's instrumental view of marriage is, I think, invaluable for today's political discourse. As Peter Coviello has argued in his 2009 Tomorrow's Parties, Olive is, and I quote, committed to progress, to bringing about a future that ameliorates, upends, or addresses what are, to her, the inequities of the present, end quote. For Olive, 
progress can be realized by utilizing the contracts through which the straight world orders social relations. All of us oriented towards a future in which her celibacy, spinsterhood, and sexual otherness can exist on its own terms, with or without the institutions through which her otherness actually becomes visible. Thus, it is not until Verena Tarrant elopes with Basil Ransom and abandons Olive that Olive herself can stand upon the stage in Boston and address the crowds that have gathered to hear her case for women's rights. It is only after Olive is outside of the bounds of a close union that she can occupy a public sphere of her own queer design. Ultimately, Jane suggests a civic future that is changed not through, or it, rather it is changed through, not for, normative institutions. It is my claim that by attending to the temporality of civic change that Olive and James suggest, we can find a critical model for the direction queerness would take after marriage equality. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I want to thank all the speakers for these engaging and challenging papers. Uh, I'm sure they're ready and eager to accept questions from any of you who have any. I hope some of you do, or if you have questions for each other. The papers do overlap in interesting ways. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to ask you, Evan, about how um, if, so you mentioned a couple of theorists, uh, more contemporary theorists. One of them is Lee Edelman, and another is Catherine von Stockton. And they seem to have sort of like opposing views in some senses, but also some coincident views about how queerness can be read through time. And I just wonder how you see them working together, since mm -hmm. you brought them both up. Sure. So in my paper, um, they weren't central theorists. Mm -hmm. In my focus, actually, they were mostly just addressed in the introduction to speak about Adam as a teenage character. Mm -hmm. So what opportunities um, there are th there because he's going through puberty. But um, let me just get to the page. <laughs> <laughs> you actually ended up using a quote that I've used elsewhere about the- Oh, uh, which one? Um, from, it was from Edelman, the part about a well, I can't do heteronormative it. families, I think. Um, yes. I don't know exactly where you- Oh, up. here we are. Okay. Yes. So Halberstam too talks about sort of reproductive time and straight time. Well, mm -hmm. Muniz says straight time and Halberstam talks about reproductive time. So what I thought was interesting was how um, childhood and children were conceived by these queer theorists as either um, one sort of opposing queerness mm -hmm. because of reproduction and the family, and the other as being inherently queer and then being straightened. Mm -hmm. And I thought that those um, are interesting, the way they can work together, because in the case of Degrassi, I think Adam is, in one way, uh, the figure of the queer child being that he was has the narrative of being born in the wrong body, thus queering him. Um, but at the same time, he's straightened through his adherence to reproductive time. So the child is basically allowed to be queer with the expectation that the child will be straightened into adulthood. So sort of this understanding that children don't know yet how to be heterosexual and thus are become heterosexual um, as they grow up. And when I was looking at particularly this idea of time and straightening, um, there's an episode where Chaz Bono is, um, he guest stars as himself. And I use that as an example of how uh, Chaz sort of offers a, f a mirror for Adam of his heteronormative future where he has promised that if he follows sort of the same uh, masculinity, heterosexuality, etc., that he can become a uh, supposedly successful um, subject the way that Chaz has in some regards and can be folded into that. 
does that address, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, address I the question? Think, <laughs> I think one of the interesting things about it is how useful both like Munoz's point of view is and how Edelman's point of view is from totally different perspectives because mm -hmm. of they indicate different kind of politics and how you align yourself temporally as a queer subject. And Edelman wants to see queerness as becoming something that can actually transform the social public sphere outside of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's a more active engagement. Um, and uh, sorry, did I say Edelman says something more about resisting any of those po uh, po mm -hmm. processes, which when you're talking about children becomes especially fraught because mm -hmm. you're ascribing identities rather than mm -hmm. allowing a sort of process of self-discovery to happen. Yeah. Which I think is why for Edelman it's so important to see the futurity as something to resist. Mm -hmm. And there's this paradox with Adam, as I said, one with the visibility of um, to be visible as trans is to make himself invisible as trans is with this narrative of the queer child where on the one hand as he is queered through the fact that he um, has this history of being raised a girl but then at the same time that's straightened into a heterosexual future that he sort of right. promises. Mm -hmm. And I, I have one other, sorry, question, maybe we can get to it later, but I, I did want to, if you can at some point talk about what you think about Orange is the New Black. Absolutely. <laughs> but. You know, I'm really interested in, you know, the question that you had brought up about, you know, um, how, what, how can queer texts teach us something about globalization, right? And, mm. and you're using the Richie texts, and maybe this, we can all answer this, but um, how can, you know, just thinking about um, that TV show, Degrassi, teach us something about globalization, right? Um, the, the kind of um, the, the, the discourse of the narrative beyond borders, right? In this case, it, it, in this hemisphere, um, being um, kind of discussed around um, trans bodies. You know, so I, I, I'm interested mm -hmm. to hear, you know, maybe what you have read around um, um, trans, um, you know, mem members of the community, how, how they're being represented in a globalized form, and then also maybe, you know, th that show, I don't know, could never be shown in the United States. What? Right? It I mean, is, I've it has been it. now. Um, it has quite a following on Teen Nick, because it is a teen show. It's considered in a lot of ways very after-school special. It's um, very, can, um, not conservative politically, conservative in terms of very PG, let's say. So it, it's actually gained quite a following amongst y young audiences in the States, uh, which uh, interestingly enough has shown quite a shift in the way the stories are told. Um, and also, for instance, now all the grads are interested in American universities on the show because Americans are watching it, so <laughs> things like that, <laughs> which is really interesting. You know, oh, I want to go to NYU. <laughs> um, and thank you for your question. I, I must say that this direction is quite new for me, and it's new for my work. I've um, done more stuff also with queer temporality than with kind of queer queerness and transnationality. So specifically regarding the question of how does the transgender come into the picture with um, transnational studies is something that I don't have a lot of experience with, but would like to, to see and work with further. So if mm -hmm. you have any thoughts, mm -hmm. or if anyone else does. One, and, of, oh, go ahead. one of the things that my, my work looks at actually is that the, it's a lot earlier than even we can identify something like trans, but um, how various uh, ideas of medicalizing and ascribing identity that emerged around the 1910s and it becoming really important for immigration policy. Um, so then keeping certain subjects in or out of the country, that level of policing and the international sphere what constitutes sexuality becomes a really important practice for governments, especially in the United States, but also in Britain. Um, so if you're looking back at like even historical discourses of queerness, they kind of emerged in the 1890s in a bi-directional relationship between Britain and the United States after Oscar Wilde. And that then impacts, since you're permeating borders at that point, um, that then impacts the way that the states start to regulate ideas of what sexuality means. And so very early on, you can kind of look at historically how um, states and rights become really important in policing what kinds of identity they recognize and then what kinds of identities they want to exclude mm -hmm. from anything like incorporation into any nation. Mm -hmm. um, and an anecdote that I just heard that was really interesting was that, uh, I, think this, I think this is right, um, 
Oscar Wilde actually visited Jefferson Davies, who was the Confederate president of the United <laughs> States um, before he was incarcerated in, in England. Um, so there's like a weird international uh, bizarre connection between queerness and what we now think of as um, liberal politics that mm -hmm. we can critique that far back. Mm -hmm. And uh, to hopefully address your question a bit in terms of the, the show, one thing I, I look at in the third section is how it feeds into uh, the narrative of the neoliberal individual. And um, one thing that's looked at, this isn't specifically citizenship, but talks about sort of access and inclusion is um, uh, a young black student uh, <clears throat> is transphobic towards Adam, and then when he says, why can't you just follow the signs on the door, Adam says, well, 50 years ago, those signs would have said whites only. And he retorts, that's different, that's racism. And then uh, sort of the narrative there is of progress where Adam b basically insinuates that transphobia is the next thing to overcome, but at the same time fails to acknowledge that uh, people of color often are already excluded from white spaces and also fails to acknowledge that trans persons can be per persons of color as well, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've also looked at, not in terms of the media, but um, some of the contradictions, for instance, with accessing um, identity. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> identification, government uh, identification, and one thing I've noticed both, I've this research has been both with Canada and the states, uh, is that the provinces and the states, most of them have different rules and regulations as well as the forms of government ID, so someone might qualify to change their sex on one form of ID, but not for the other, and now suddenly they have conflicting uh, gender markers on their ID are conflicting names and now suddenly then that they're targeted and sort of why are these conflicting and so because one might be state run and the other is federally run uh, those laws don't actually align with each other so what happens is a lot of trans people aren't able to change their IDs or they can only change some of their IDs which then create more conflicts and of course if you're not a citizen then the chances of even getting sort of treatment or any proper identification um, shrink. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all for your presentations. They were quite fascinating. Um, I have a question for Bethan. Um, I study a lot of literature with trans characters and um, and queer characters, and the the trend for the longest time until, you know, early 2000s was sort of, you know, you have your character who gets to explore a little bit and then they're like either killed off or, you know, something horrible happens to them. And I'm wondering what your um, thoughts are on the way that um, Adam was mm -hmm. treated on the show in terms of that um, sort yeah. of ending. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that actually because that's that's my conclusion to my paper and um, unfortunately there wasn't room. But what's very interesting is that, and the producers have spoken about this, was the actor, her contract was up and thus it, the, uh, Degrassi is known for telling stories um, and killing off characters in a way that deal with um, sort of hard-hitting issues. So there's cancer, you know, every couple seasons someone has cancer, every couple seasons someone is killed. These types of things. Now, what's so fascinating about Adam was that, first of all, right now in the States, the leading cause of teen death is texting while driving. So he died the most statistically normal way possible, which means even in his death, he was completely normalized. Also, they use that opportunity to add to his trans story without having to explore it. So for instance, he, uh, we don't find out that he's started hormone blockers until he's in the hospital and the doctor says she, and they say, that's my son, he's transgender, and they ask, okay, is he uh, on any medication? And the mom just slips in, he just started estrogen blockers. And we know Adam was on the road to correcting himself. So it's, it's very interesting how that comes into play, also because he, um, he's remembered as sort of Becky's boyfriend, he's remembered as Drew's brother, and Drew says um, at the end that he 
Adam's never really gone because he's up here. And why that's so interesting is in a previous episode, Adam says that up here, he's a boy. So Adam's gonna forever be remembered in Drew's mind as a boy and thus solidified as uh, his transness is erased. And what the producers said when they said why they chose this was they took one of the most beloved characters to teach the story. So even though, historically speaking, trans characters are notoriously killed off, as well as other queer characters, they decided to, to use him for that emotional leverage, but in turn, that meant there's, no, there's not a trans character on the show anymore. So, yeah. I have a question if we still have a moment Please, yes, for um, yes, both of the other presenters. I was fascinated by how you both in your own ways outlined the kind of repression of queer difference or kind of queer alterity to, uh, for the purpose of queer normalization regimes. And I was interested, and I think what you've already gestured to, toward, which is how um, one can recover the pr productivity of difference in this. But I wonder if you could speak more on and what you see as the productivity or the kind of agency of difference within the context of your work. Mm. Why don't you start? Sure. Um, I mean, it's kind of weird going back to the Bostonians for that just because there isn't a lexicon for that kind of thing. But I think that's actually one of the reasons that going back to that text is fun, uh, because of the ways that the novel starts to ascribe difference and treat it really actually pretty <coughs> brutally. It's not a very nice novel to uh, Olive Chancellor, who's the uh, sort of like proto-queer character in the novel. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the scholarship also mistreats this one character um, and sees her as being in some sense malicious or untrustworthy. But there's been a lot of work recently to recover her character and see it as something positive. And that's, uh, I think, actually where I got interested in the temporal question as well. Um, the novel ends with all of actually performing the things she had not been able to perform for the whole novel. So after getting involved in these cases that are marriage-like, um, and moving between discernible identities, she finally comes into the fore when she rejects all the other ways that people have tried to ascribe her to an identity. And to, to me, that's like the recuperative move sure. that you can really make and find something provocative and uh, politically moving in her own claiming of difference that happens, however briefly, at the end of the novel. I mean, this is not a novel that is like parading the case for difference in any way because it's a really mean novel to mm -hmm. all of, but there is this little turn at the end in which you can really start to see it as a positive. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I think is really interesting about Adam is he's, um, his stepbrother is sort of more hyper-masculine jock, but doesn't have the same intellectual abilities. So Adam sort of essentially becomes as normal as normal can be. So he's not hyper-masculine, but he's not effeminate. He's athletic enough but he's not a jock. He's smart enough, but he's not in the gifted program. He's funny, he's <laughs> likable. And um, there's a scene where he, um, he gets, he literally gets thrown out of the men's washroom. And as a consequence, he is um, designated to the gender neutral accessible washroom, which he calls the handicap crapper. Um, what's so interesting about that is there's a scene where he is facing the wheelchair symbol with no gender signifiers and he looks very upset and he's banging hurry up and Dave who had bullied him walks by and kind of it's like oh my god wow that must suck yeah now I get it like you know this able person is being consigned to this washroom but what's never addressed is who was in that washroom that he was banging on telling to hurry up there no one with um, any actual disabilities is ever shown in that regard. So even there, the, he is effectively um, engaging in ableism. Mm -hmm. And why it's such a strong scene is because as the audience, we see a white male presenting able-bodied person not having access to white male space. And that is what creates the sympathy. Mm -hmm. So he's he becomes the productive subject by adhering to all the forms of normativity. And like I said, he's very likable, he has the radio show, he's funny, people think he's, mm -hmm. he's just very personable, and that's why he became such a beloved character. He doesn't sort of do anything wrong. 
Yeah. Is there a final question? We have one minute, I think. <laughs> Well, if not, I want to thank our speakers very, very much, and thank you all for being here.